So, how's everybody doing? Did you make it through yesterday? I know. Hectic, hectic day if you're a Florida Gators fan. We'll talk about some of it, at least here on Locked On Gators. You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Locked On Gators, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day every day. We are available daily and free reviews in the podcast. Happy Wednesday. I'm Brandon Olson. Find me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with whole nine sports, Giants, Country, NFL 33. Today's episode of Lockdown Gators is brought to you by Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash Lockdown College. Use code Lockdown College for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks is a daily fantasy sports made easy. Uh, also, check out the subtext if you have not yet. Two weeks free, five bucks a month after that. No commitment whatsoever. Uh, link is in the description below if you want to be a Lockdown Gators insider. But, um, man, yesterday was a, was a fun day. Fun, fun day because we spent, and why we, I mean, Gator Nation spent the entire day fretting and sweating about Trevor Etienne. Um, because, of course, yesterday, uh, let, let's take it back even further than that. Early this season, there were people going, Trevor Etienne's going to leave if he's not the starter. Uh huh. Um, and that was a big justification for starting Trevor over Montreal. That wasn't what happened at all with the coaching staff, of course, but that was, that was a big thing with Florida Gators fans was if you don't start Trevor Etienne, he's going to leave. Then yesterday we start, actually let, let's go back a little bit last week. Even I was told Trevor's staying. Um, hmm. and then yesterday we hear the rumors during the day nothing's official to this point whether he will or won't enter the transfer portal but it's important to acknowledge what we're talking about and why partially nil partially wanting to win and i want to make this part clear it's not about playing time because trevor Etienne's actually in an ideal situation right now in terms of playing time where he gets good bulk of the carries he finished with 130 carries, and I think Montreal Johnson had 131 or 151. Um, but it's also important to remember Trevor Etienne did not play in, in one of the games. He, he missed a game, and he got injured towards the end of the Florida State game. He missed time. Okay? So had Trevor been completely healthy, odds are they would have been neck and neck with carries. That's great for him because he gets enough carries to show what he can do to the NFL, but he also doesn't run the risk of being run into the ground by this offense. So there's that. Uh, I will also say that I do think it's funny the coping that we see from a lot of Florida Gators fans where they go, well, if he wanted to be a feature back, he should get better at pass blocking. My brother in Christ, I've been trying to tell you guys for two seasons now, he is awful in pass protection. Been trying to tell you for two seasons. Um, and at first it was, you're just nitpicking things. Um, no, he's awful. And But that's neither here nor there. I just, I just wanted to point out that it's very funny. I've been talking about that for two seasons. And all of a sudden, when it becomes a legitimate possibility that he might leave, it's, well, he should be better in pass pro. Um, that's not it. It's nothing to do with that. It's not the feature back thing because the rumors of where he might go are not places where he'd be a featured back. So there's that. Uh, also yesterday we heard a little murmur of Charlie Partridge, who is currently the Pittsburgh defensive line coach. I will say the first place I heard it was Gator Dave on Twitter. Um, that, that's where I first saw the, the Charlie Partridge. I keep saying Chris because of the Michigan guy, they're not related. Um, but, but Charlie Partridge who has experience, I mean, defensive, I, I was talking to someone that covers Pitt, and he was just like, look like the dude's a pillar 
in this culture, in this development along the defensive line. We were top three in sacks for five years in a row, and he was a massive part of all of those. Good developer, good recruiter, and guess what? Top three sacks with Pitt players. That's not a knock on, on Pitt as a program, but imagine the edge rushers and the athletes you can get in Florida. Uh, so I think that's a big part too, where now you're looking at Charlie Partridge. And I know that we are spending a few minutes on ETN, a few minutes on the Charlie Partridge stuff, because we have Hayden Hansen joining us in a couple of minutes. Um, but with Charlie Partridge, good defensive line developer, good defensive line recruiter. And he's from Florida. He's from Florida. He spent uh, a couple of seasons in, or a couple of years, uh, not seasons, but a couple of years in high school recruiting or high school coaching in Florida. And then he went all, all around. He was at Wisconsin. He was one of the people who coached JJ Watt and developed him, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he was a defensive line coach at Pitt. He, he's been around the block a little bit. Great resume that he has as a developer, as a recruiter. He's someone that you should probably look at as, I think, top of my list for who I'd want to be the new defensive line coach for Florida, but also near the top of the list for realistic hires. There's not really a direct connection between Billy Napier and Charlie Partridge, but we do know that Charlie Partridge, for years, has wanted to come to Gainesville. Every time there's an opening, and not, not just in Gainesville, in Miami and Florida State, he wants to coach in the state of Florida as a defensive line coach. Bring him in. He was the head coach at FAU for a few seasons. He's got ties to the state of Florida. He's someone that you can at least look at and say, hey, maybe we take a swing. But he's also someone who's a, again, proven developer. John Spencer was a proven developer. I would stand by that. But didn't work out. Okay. And and that's fair. No, you know, no sense in crying over spilled milk. But Charlie Bartridge, proven developer, defensive lines under him have gotten consistent results. Imagine that with TJ Searcy, Kelby Collins, Chris McLellan. I know that there are like Twitter rumors of Des Watson. I personally, I'm hoping Desmond Watson comes back. I think that he's taken strides every year. I get it. He's limited ceiling wise. But hey, man, if you could be just a, a, a big nose tackle with the occasional pushing the pocket. Hell yeah. Give me that every single time. Okay. Like, like I will never turn that down. If you're a nose tackle and you can get me one sack a year. Hell yeah. Do it. I don't need you to be a pass rusher. Third downs. You're probably not going to be on the field anyway. So I don't need that. But I, I personally like him to say, uh, I think that when you look at the youth here, and I know that Florida has their edge group that works separately from their defensive line group. I understand that they're still going to overlap in some things. And, and Chris Partridge, if he is the defensive line coach, would obviously bring in some of his practices and techniques and, and intermingle that with Mike Peterson, um, who does coach the edges and is expected to be retained. So I think that when you're looking at just like, this is a, a crazy off season right now, this week is going to continue to be crazy. Hell, next week is going to be crazy. Pretty much the month of December is probably going to be pretty freaking crazy if you're a Florida Gators fan. Tomorrow, we'll talk about staff changes, transfer portal, recruiting, more stuff that we have to talk about with this wild, wild west of an offseason. Hell, if there's big enough news, maybe we go live today. But now we are about to be joined by Hayden Hansen for the last time this season. Um, yeah, last time that, that we've got Hayden this season. We will have him most likely again next year. Big fan of his game. Love what he was able to do and love what he was able to develop to. Uh, fantastic character as well. So I will say that before he even hops on and, and we have a bit of a conversation. Before Hayden joins us, let me tell you guys about Prize Picks because Prize Picks has been the best way for me to make money playing daily fantasy sports this year. If you've got skills, you can turn 10 bucks into 250 bucks with a few easy taps. And it's important to remember this part, research, okay? It's simple and easy to play with quick withdrawals too. And it's what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. So I will say with the absolute kindness of my heart, my, my whole heart, thank you to Bam Adebayo, thank you to Brooke Lopez, and thank you to Brandon Miller for, and Donovan Mitchell, sorry, for yesterday 
your service is greatly appreciated for my bank account. Go to prizepicks.com slash college. Use code college for a first deposit match up to $100. PrizePix is daily fantasy sports made easy. Joining me now for Locked On Gators one last time this year. Just, just one more. That's it. It's Florida Gators starting tight end Hayden Hansen. And I got to tell you, Hayden, I don't know how you guys physically like handle playing in some of these games because I was sitting on my couch and I thought my heart was going to explode watching that Florida State game. So I, I genuinely have no idea how you guys can stomach that because I'm ready to puke and, I, and I'm I'm sitting. It's insane to me. Yeah, you just really locked in on the game, you know. Um, you you definitely feel the pressure a lot, you know. But I mean, when you're when it's your turn to you know try to change the tide of the game, you really don't think about that stuff. You just think about how can I not mess this up, you know. So you really, you, but like when you're on the sideline, like watching a kick or watching the defense, you're like, okay, I, I understand what the fans talk about, you know. Because you can't yeah. control it. So. I, I can't screw this one up. I just have to watch, and that's that, that's just what I got to deal with there. But, I mean, just going to that Florida State game, first off, how do you think Max handled his first week as a starter, just like from, from practice through the game to locker room after? I don't, I don't know if he said anything there, but just how do you think Max kind of handled his first week with that amount of pressure? Yeah, I mean, I'm a Max Brown fan, you know. Um, I love that kid. Uh, he – I mean, think about it. You – about two years straight, no start. Last game of the season against the number four team in the nation. I mean, yeah, they had their backup quarterback, but we're not playing against their offense. You know, they had all their – they had Jared Burrs. Uh, they just had very good players like that. And I feel like he held his own. I mean, obviously, there could have been throws he made, but there could have been stuff we all could have done better. But I think for the most part, for his first ever start in the swamp, sold out, he had a lot of poise to him, you know. He had that confidence. Um, I mean, we, no one's perfect, you know. But, uh, I mean, he hit me with a pretty nice ball on that wheel route. Um, I was I think I was surprised. He, he threw that needle right into my chest. I didn't have to reach for it or anything. So, I, I think he definitely showed flashes, you know, and um, I'll be keeping up with him for sure. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about that because when that play was unfolding, like on the, on the broadcast angle at least, I was so positive he was just taking the check down there. <laughs> and then he just threw a laser. Just, just what, what, what happened on that – play and yet like the hell of a throw like that was, that is a ballsy throw to make in, in that game yeah so I mean I knew I was gonna get I knew I was gonna get that backer just because of the concept we had called but I also knew that Ricky was in front of me so I was like you know maybe Max is gonna dump it to Ricky you know why not I, I wouldn't blame him but once I ran that flat I turned and I saw him turn after I already turned I was like oh he's gotta throw this and we made eye contact for like that split second it was like we were talking to each other I was like oh you gotta throw this dude <laughs> and he, he threw it I turned around I thought I was gonna score I just feel about 200 pounds just dropping my ankles and I was like oh so yeah that was that was just an insane play like I think everybody was just like he really just throw that so, like, like I, I, I couldn't believe because you know you think a kid making his first career start probably going to be generally conservative with the ball because your your mindset there is probably just like don't screw this up like like that's all you want to do you just don't want to be the guy that screws it up but just what was that game like on the offensive side because I feel like Florida State just came out insanely aggressive and, and I mean I feel like it clearly threw at least a wrench into the plans for the offense there. Yeah, so I mean, we we got moving pretty early, uh, but not as early as we wanted to, obviously. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they had some good players. Uh, they watched a lot of film. They were prepared for some of our attacks, so we had to slow it down a little bit. Obviously, the trick play was about two seconds away from being a huge play. Um, I mean, they just they attacked that perfectly. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it just comes down to execution, and we didn't execute the best we could. Um, we, I mean, we were execute, we executed enough to make it a game, but we didn't execute enough to win the game. Yeah, and then I, I do have to ask because we talked about the Missouri game where you had a few like one on one opportunities against number six on Mizzou, who's going to be a Sunday player. But last week, you had a few one on one opportunities against Jared Verse, who not just Sunday player, like like he's probably going to be a first round pick. So just w- what was that like? Because that dude's a, a wrecking ball. Yeah, just different, man. He's he's uh, every category is just a little better than everyone we played this year. You know, um, there was one play, I think it was third and seven where he tackled Trevor in the backfield. That play ran a lot that pin and pull were the tackle pulls and I pin. I didn't lay a hand on him. Like I knew, I knew he knew the play too. Cause we, I screwed it in. He looked at me. I'm like, Oh, I, 
you know, I, I couldn't move a little closer because I didn't know when Max was snapping it, so I just had to sit there. I was like, I'm just going to throw myself at him and hope I can get something on him, you know. And he just went straight past Damian right when he pulled. I had no chance. So, I mean, it's just things like that, you know. He's a professional. He attacks it like that. He watched the film. He knew it was coming. Just a good player. It, it was just – it came down to plays like that in the game where we kind of just stalled out on offense. Yeah, um, that I mean – I'm not going to pretend Jared versus he's a monster. There's just no other way to talk about it. I mean, there during that game too, he, first off, he did the Gator chomp while they were losing. And I was just like, that's bold to do that. That's really bold to do while you're losing. Uh, and secondly, there was one play. It was after he pushed uh, Damien into Max Brown. Yeah. He, he like looked right at Damien after and he was just like, yeah. Like, and I was like, Oh, that's like, that dude's in another zone right now. It's just, one of those players was just impossible there, but done with that game. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to have as many top tier candidates as possible to interview. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn jobs. LinkedIn jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. And LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals. That's what makes it the best place to hire. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. And thankfully, with LinkedIn, the process is intuitive, quick, and easy. It's like, I I love LinkedIn. I'll tell you that. Go ahead. Add me on it. I don't care. I'm... I'm open to connecting. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. That's LinkedIn.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Year two is in the books for you. What was your favorite game, favorite moment from that time? Because last year I asked that, but of course it was your your retro. And now you're actually out there every single week. So just what was your favorite game, favorite moment from this season? Yeah. So I mean, obviously I'm about to go with Kentucky. The touchdown was my favorite moment, but. I'd say overall, favorite game was Tennessee. I feel like that, that was one of our most complete games. I guess the Tennessee team has been rolling after ever since they lost to us, you know. Um, I just feel like if we would have played more like that against the better teams on our schedule, we would have had some more wins. Um, but I just feel like that game right there showed our potential this year and just that that was what we could have been, you know. And we just got to go back to the drawing board and figure out how to play like that every week. But that Tennessee game was enjoyable, man. I mean, I didn't even get the, I don't even think I had a target that game and it was enjoyable. You know, I just enjoyed moving people, watching Trevor run in the end zone, you know, the rivalry. I mean, rivalries are so much better when you win, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I, I'd agree. I think that was the most complete game. I think defensively, like Austin Armstrong, the hell of a strategy with, I, I feel it was so weird because while I was watching it, I knew what he was doing. Where I was like, why is like Princely's motioning out with the running back when he motions that it's such a weird thing, but, complete clamps on that the high octane offense and then yeah i mean you guys just that was the game i think where uh we had the clip of the gh counter i think it was with yeah. you and micah coming through yeah uh that was just that was a, a hell of a game there and now i have to ask the flip side of that question what was the abs like the, the most heartbreaking moment i guess or game from this season yeah um Let's see. I'm trying to think. Well, we had a couple. Um, I'd say it's a, it's a coin flip between the miss, the game winning field goal against Arkansas, or the fourth and 17 against Mizzou. I'll, I'll probably go with Mizzou just because it would have been a more impressive win. Um, that was definitely, I, I was on the sideline on one knee, just closed my eyes, and I heard a bunch of screaming. I was like, crap. Looked up, and Burden caught it. I was like, all right. Uh, but I mean, yeah, those two games were pretty, uh, pretty heartbreaking. So. Yeah, um, you guys t- taking a few years off my life this year. Just, just, just know that that that's what that's what it's been like on this side of things. But heading into the off season now, you went from last year, didn't play this year. First game was a backup, and then after that, you had the starting job throughout. As the season went on, you got more involved in the passing game, which is also weird because like your targets didn't increase much. It was just like. You happen to be way more open uh, on those and more downfield there. But going into this, just what's the area where this offseason you're like, this is this is what I need to attack and improve most on? Yeah, I mean, my routes can always be better. You know, we're tight ends. We're not receivers. So we always strive to be like receivers. So that's always something that you can chase. And uh, you can never be too good with your footwork in the red blocking game. So 
Uh, I mean, but first, first and foremost, I'm just going to work on my fundamentals, you know, but I'm definitely going to try to get better with the routes, you know, um, to maybe play a little H next year. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, why, why not? I already got Tony going to be with another year in the system. You and Arliss another year together. I don't know what Amir Jackson's role is going to be early, but true freshman. So we'll see. But your freshman season, you were under William Piegler, who then went to the Cardinals. Your redshirt freshman season was under Russ Calloway, who still here. What would you say were the biggest differences for you as a player underneath them now that you've had a full year, basically, or you've had a spring and a season under both of them? Yeah, just two different coaching styles, you know. Um, Russ, is, I feel like Russ was just a little more uh, interactive. Um, he he, re he reviews a lot more. Uh, Piegler was more of do it in person more, like in practice more. Like we'll be in meetings with Callaway. We'll probably go over the same play three times, and he'll test us. Like we'll look at it once on the install on the board, turn it off. He'll ask us the same thing. We have to tell him. He'll tell us the whole play. We'll tell him the formation, where we line up, what we're doing, what's the rule, what we're doing if we change it, all that stuff. I think that really helps the mental side of things. Um, and Piegler was more of a believer of – um, you you get that from experience, you know, and he was more of hands on. Callaway was more of mental prep. So I mean, it's just two different two different scenarios of I mean, whatever you prefer. They both are good at their jobs. Obviously, one's in the NFL now, and one was in the NFL. So um, they're both obviously successful. So yeah, and I have to ask for Russ Callaway. I don't know why I called him Russ. Like he's my best friend. Um, but for Coach Callaway there. Uh, he's got a reputation as like an, an air raidy type play caller because he used to be with Samford and, and he was more so has that helped you specifically as just as as a pass catcher where it's like the guy who's built around like his, his entire philosophy throughout his career has been more air raid style yeah I mean he he helps me a lot with the receiver drills like um, in the spring ball and summer he has a he has a lot of good receiver drills to kind of get your muscle memory down we have like the contested catches drill the, uh, he also codes with like specific footworks and the like exact angles you come out of on your break routes, like negative angles on digs and stuff like that. It's just those little things that make a difference. Cause then, I mean, in the SEC, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to get that separation. So every little detail matters. Yeah. These linebackers and these here are what used to be safeties now. It, it's ridiculous, but they're still the same size as linebackers. Um, and then before I let you go, can I get a, a player or two this season that kind of, grew the most in your eyes, whether it's on field, off field, starter, guy who's never touched the field, whatever it is? Yeah, so let's see. I'll give you one on each side of the ball. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, for defense, defense, I'll probably go with um, uh, Bryce Thornton. He, he made some strides. Um, he's a hard worker. I, I'm, I'm excited to see what happens. And I'll give you a bonus one, too. Jakeem Jackson, he, he took some strides, too. Um, an offense, the uh, offense is it's hard because we had a lot of guys kind of take a stride, you know, uh, especially early on. Um, I'll give you the I'll give you the obvious answer, the boring answer, but Trey Wilson, you know, that dude's gonna be special. Dude has like no ACLs whatsoever because you can just stop on demand. And uh, Jake Slaughter too. Jake Slaughter really embraced the role. He's I mean that's hard to do when you're a backup and you know you're not gonna play until Kingsley graduates, and all of a sudden he's in and out hurt. He's trying not to try not to ruin his future. It's hard to stay ready that whole time. And when, when you get that chance, I mean, he was, he was solid for us all year. Yeah. Uh, I think that what Jake slaughtered did this year was just insane. Con considering there was like the expectation was always Kingsley's going to start every single game. He's going to be the guy. Then he got hurt like a week before Utah and Jake was constantly in and out of the lineup. And I think that's also a difficult part where it's like, you never really know if, if it's going to be you or Kingsley at that point. But, uh, yeah, thank you so much, Hayden, for another year of this. Uh, we'll be in touch. You know that. But catch Hayden next year every Saturday for your Florida Gators and for Lockdown Gators. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. We are available daily and free wherever you listen to the podcast. We'll be back tomorrow to talk more Florida Gators football for Lockdown Gators. I'm Brandon Olson. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with Whole Nine Sports, Giants Country, NFL 33, and I'll see you all tomorrow.